name is Kat Oriel with Forbes Breaking News, and today I'm here with Representative Nicole Maliotakis of New York. Congresswoman, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Of course, on Tuesday, former Gov Andrew Cuomo testified behind closed doors before the House Select Subcommittee on COVID and his leadership during the pandemic. You sit on the committee. What did the former governor? Let's actually start before um, the testimony on Tuesday and go back to a few years ago and talk about what the former governor did during COVID that put him in the center of controversy that is eventually partially what led to his resignation in 2021. Yeah, on March 25th, 2020, um, his Department of Health, uh, on a letterhead with his name on top, as well as the DOH Commis Commissioner Howard uh, Zucker, issued a mandatory order to the nursing homes to accept COVID-positive patients that were being discharged from hospitals. Uh, the directive was a mandate. There was no, you should, you could, it, it, it was you have to, and you had no ability to reject uh, these individuals if they were COVID positive. Um, and furthermore, it didn't take into account whether the nursing homes had the ability to care for them, whether they had the ability to separate COVID positive from negative, uh, whether they had the staffing levels, whether they had the PPE. And I remember it very clear that day because I, I remember when I heard of the directive, it was shocking to me because we've always said all along that our seniors were the most vulnerable. Um, and we quickly started reaching out to the governor's office and myself, other elected officials around the state, nursing homes were complaining to us that they were very concerned. They felt that they could not handle this task and that they had no ability to reject these patients. Um, and as a result, thousands of, of uh, senior citizens passed away because that order was kept in place for months. And one of the most troubling things about the testimony that occurred on Tuesday was that the governor claimed that he did not know anything about this directive, that he did not uh, approve it, that his health commissioner didn't approve it. And somehow some you know, mid-level staffer at the Department of Health uh, put this deadly directive through on their own without any approval, which nobody believes that that happened. Um, we find it very difficult to believe that this governor, who was was a micromanager, that he did 111 daily briefings with all the details of what was going on in the state, all the new mandates, all the all the new um, responses, did not know that the, a, a directive of this magnitude went out on letterhead with his name and his commissioner's name. So I think it was one of the most shocking moments: uh, the the refusal to admit, you know, any any type of responsibility or to show any type of remorse. You know, when asked the question, would you change this directive, knowing what you know today after thousands of uh, New Yorkers died, he said no. He said he would actually explain it more to nursing homes and communicate it more, trying to blame the nursing homes that they didn't, they didn't, I guess, understand that they could reject patients, which was never the case. That That's not what the directive says. As a matter of fact, it says they could not deny these patients. Uh, nowhere in the directive does it say whether you you know if you can if you can't handle them then we'll let us know and we'll send them somewhere else. That was never an option, um, and so it really is contrary to what the statements at the time he was making. Um, and and I, I I think it was very sad to say that you know that this was obviously a mistake or in hindsight. Uh, we, this shouldn't have been. He tried to blame everybody basically. Mm -hmm. Tried to be, blame everybody from you know, the, the nursing homes, so the nursing home staff members were going out at night and coming and bringing COVID inside the nursing homes, he claimed. He tried to blame the federal government, the CDC and CMS, saying that their directive mirrored the federal government's um, guidelines. The federal government issued guidelines. They, they, these are recommendations, never said, you, never said to mandate the nursing homes take COVID positive patients. It said that they could if they had the ability to care for them and they could, they could you know, go about in a safe manner um, and separate them, right? But but his order was very different. And so the fact that he kept pointing to the CMS and, and, and uh, CDC guidelines as the, you know, for justification was just ridiculous because the wording is different. It's just one's a mandate, one's a recommendation, period. Um, well, in the past, I know that he has blamed also former President Trump by name as well. Was he blaming him as well? Uh, he blamed President Trump, but more on uh, why his why his reporting numbers were so low. Uh, he blamed two people. He blamed the attorney general, who he felt put out a report um, 
right before the governor was going to unveil his report with accurate numbers to the state legislature, supposedly. Um, and then he blamed the governor, I mean, the president for uh, claiming that he was over inflating numbers uh, and that he should not be putting in presumed deaths in those figures. So he tried to blame everybody. Uh, and, that, and that was, I mean, he blamed the state legislature at one point. He, he, he blamed these federal agencies. He blamed the nursing homes. He blamed uh, so many different people, so many different people, um, except for himself, took zero responsibility, showed zero remorse. Uh, and even if given the opportunity today, would he change the directive if he could edit it? And he said no. And that I thought was very unfortunate. Um, and I think, it, it, you know, again, the buck stops with you when you're the governor of a state. If this happens in your administration, you should be turning the place upside down to figure out who was responsible if it is a staff member, as he claims. The fact that we're here, thousands of seniors have died, and he didn't take the time to figure out who it was that did this under his name on the stationery, that's outrageous, uh, and it's unacceptable, and that's why we feel like he's not being truthful with our committee. Well, as a viewer, it's interesting that we can feel how tense congressional oversight hearings can be, especially the COVID subcommittee hearings sometimes as well. So can you just describe, I mean, you described him not being remorseful. What was he like when he was sitting in that chair in front of all of you? Look, I think he, he was he was cordial. He was trying to be friendly. Um, he, he was trying to make conversations during the breaks. Um, but but the but the biggest thing, the biggest takeaway was that he spent most of the time pointing and deflecting. Uh, and for somebody, again, who did 111 briefings all in a row during the, the height of COVID, who knew the num, who was you know dictating each and every day the changes that the state was doing toward their policy, issuing new mandates, issuing new guidelines. Um, and you know, for him to say that he didn't know anything about this, uh, this this guidance or this mandate that came out of the Department of Health with his name on top of it, as well as the health commissioner, is just is just it's not believable to me, and I don't think it's believable to anybody in the state of New York. Um, but you know, I think uh, you know he was there for seven hours. It was a very long time. We get, did get to ask many questions, and you know, it wasn't political. The Democrats asked tough questions as well. They asked him about. Um, preferential treatment of family and friends to get COVID tests uh, and why at the same time they were doing that when nursing homes were prohibited from testing our most vulnerable to protect our most vulnerable. Um, and, you know, he, he said that everyone that came in contact with the governor was being tested. So, you know, obviously that's more important than, you know, these senior citizens at the nursing home or anyone else who wanted access to the test. So they highlighted that they felt that that was uh, an abuse of power. Um, and it, it was, you know, you have to make tough decisions, but you should be doing it in the interest of, of the public. So they highlighted that and they, they focused a lot as well, the Democrats, on the, the numbers, the reporting. How come New York's uh, numbers were so inaccurate when they were first reporting them? Uh, and it wasn't until the attorney general's report had come out that um, we found out the truth. Now, the governor claims that this was a political hit job by the attorney general, which I could believe, quite frankly, uh, that she was trying to get ahead of him uh, in issuing this report for political purposes, um, and that's quite possible. Uh, but I, I, you know, again, it's it's it begs the question: Was there some type of monetary incentive um, when you shifted people from a hospital setting to a nursing home setting versus a makeshift facility like the? Uh, U.S. Navy comfort ship that came to our shores uh, or the Javits Center or the South Beach Psychiatric makeshift uh, hospital that was set up on Staten Island. And I asked that question if the reimbursements were different. He said he did not have that information. But I think the committee has to find that information because I think it's a critical piece to maybe give us a better look as to was there a motivation? Was there a monetary incentive to do this ridiculous policy uh, for the nursing homes? Um, and one of the other things was, you know, he he when we brought up the issue of these alternative facilities that were set up to take COVID positive patients, why were they not being used? Because that mandate stayed in place even after the comfort ship was in our shores and the Javits Center was set up. Governor said that they were not they were not there to take positive patients. But that's contrary to what the media reports say. I mean, New York Times 
um, and other, even, even the Department of uh, Defense website says that the, the comfort ship was here specifically for COVID positive patients, uh, but it wasn't being used. Neither was the Javits Center. Uh, and, and South Beach Psychiatric Center in Staten Island was hardly used as well. So there is, that is a valid question as to why those facilities were not being used. And was it because of some type of reimbursements that hospitals and nursing homes may have received? I don't know. I mean, that's but that is something that I brought up to the committee that we need to continue to dig further and, and find the answer. Mm -hmm. That being said, are there plans for the committee to further grill him on all of these topics? And do you think that the House will take action, especially since it's on a bipartisan basis, that they want him to be held accountable? Is there going to be action on bringing him to justice? Well, look, I think that, um, number one, I think it's very possible that he comes for a, a public hearing under oath. Um, that's the chairman's discretion. We'll have to see what happens. Uh, this committee is only expected to last through the end of the year. Uh, it's been set up as a task force, as a, uh, a temporary committee to develop a report with recommendations on what, what was done, what could be done better, the origins, the pandemic preparedness, um, making sure we fix our pharmaceutical supply chains. We're not relying on communist China. Uh, making sure that no more federal funds make its way to dangerous experiments overseas and facilities that are doing subpar conditions like the Wuhan lab. We already took action there, and it's because of the work of this committee that money has been stopped uh, from going to the Wuhan lab again, and also to EcoHealth, EcoHealth, uh, which was the New York City entity that funneled that money to Wuhan lab, is no longer eligible for federal grants. So that in itself was a huge um, exposure that we did and, and we were able to protect taxpayers, but also protect the public because we could be preventing the next pandemic from being manufactured in a lab uh, by that move. So I think that was a real significant thing. Uh, the pharmaceutical supply chain, I've just introduced legislation to try to bring more of our domestic production. 70 to 80% of our pharmaceuticals are being um, APIs, active pharmaceutical ingredients, are being produced in India and communist China. That cannot be. We need to bring that here for national security reasons um, and to protect American citizens. And so that's another big issue that I think will come out of this committee. And yes, there should be some accountability measures. Uh, we, we, we obviously got to get the facts first. And there have been contrary statements made to this committee uh, whether it be uh, by Dr. Fauci and his senior advisor or Governor Cuomo and other individuals within his administration. We need to see if somebody committed perjury is lying to Congress, but also if 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 there was something nefariously that was done in a, in a criminal manner. I mean, we're not there yet, but it could certainly happen down the line. Um, and, and again, it's about following the facts to where they lead and then making sure that this never happens again, that we prepare this country uh, so we're in a better place, that we never allow, you know, it, so many of the things that have happened. I mean, there's so many different areas uh, that we've dived into, but um, making sure we, we we protect Americans for the future is our number one priority. How do you feel about the rumblings that he might run for mayor? And if the choice is between Cuomo or Mayor Adams, who would you pick? <laughs> I, I would pick a third candidate. I don't know. <laughs> Um, well, look, I, I, it's possible. I, I, the, I could see the governor running for something again in the future. I don't know if it would be mayor or it'd be governor, uh, or U S Senate perhaps. Uh, but I think the way he was, uh, you know, forced to leave, I think I could see, I could see somebody like him, uh, wanting to make a political comeback. Um, and, you know, perhaps, uh, the information that we're exposing, uh, may prevent him from being able to do that, or maybe people will see uh, him in a different light. But everybody knows what happened in New York, right? And there are some things that he did well, and there are other things that were terrible, arbitrary mandates that have come out that really hurt our students, that really, I mean, students committed suicide because they didn't have social interaction uh, with, with classmates. Uh, businesses were destroyed. Livelihoods were destroyed. Um, so there's some good things that happened in New York and some very bad things that happened in New York. And on the top of that list is this mandate um, that 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 ended up uh, leading to thousands of our senior citizens, our most vulnerable, dying. And that, you know, families want answers. Families want accountability. They will not forget this. I certainly won't forget it. Uh, so making sure we get 
that answer, those answers for them, uh, I think is so, is so critical um, to, to everyone's future. Well, thank you. And one last question, if I may, how was the meeting this morning between former President Donald Trump and House Republicans? It was a great meeting. I think uh, I think the gov the I think the president did uh, a really good job uh, showing what a, a a another term under President Trump would be, and it would be you know smart energy policy that will make gas prices more affordable, food costs inflation uh, more affordable, food inflation to come down, uh, so people can afford to live in this country, put a roof over their head, put food on their table, pay their electric bills. I think that's uh, was a main part of his focus was showing the contrast between the Biden disastrous economy that we have right now with the highest interest rates in decades, with gas prices that are double from when President Trump left, um, and how Americans are just getting crushed with inflation fueled by those anti-energy policies of President Biden, and where we were, right, with the lowest unemployment, uh, wages were lifted, Americans, six million Americans lifted out of poverty because of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. Uh, we saw our economy booming up until COVID sadly struck. Uh, but I, I, there's there's a stark contrast between where we were. We had peace through strength. Now we have appeasement of our adversaries, two wars that we are involved in, and we have a Russian military ship just off the coast of the United States, all because of appeasement of adversaries. We don't have dom domestic energy independence uh, because President Biden undid the policies of President Trump. He shut down the Keystone Pipeline, and now we're begging Venezuela for dirtier oil and filling their coffers instead of creating American jobs and uh, uh, making American prosperous and independent here at home. Uh, the border is another stark contrast. We had secure border. We did not have this mass immigration that you have today in cities like mine. In fact, we never had it under any other president except for Joe Biden. His 60 policy changes led to the mess that we're seeing right now, where we have ISIS members inside the United States of America during a time of war where our adversary, our, our adversaries are, are picking and bullying and terrorizing Israel, attacking Israel, our ally. That is so incredibly dangerous. Uh, I just hope we can get President Trump back in office before we have a terrorist attack because of the stupidity of the Biden administration. Their reckless policies are putting America at risk. And as somebody who represents New York City in a post 9-11 world, that is the thing that scares me the most. And yesterday, it, it again, once again, we saw terrorists caught in our interior that came over Joe Biden's open border. Rep. Melitakis, thanks so much for your time today. Hey, thank you. Appreciate it.